Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is David Halperin. I'm the CEO uh, of Israel Policy Forum. I want to thank our returning viewers, uh, as well as welcome uh, those who are joining us for the first time. I especially want to thank our supporters. And you all can become supporters by joining uh, us at our website, israelpolicyforum.org support. Before we start off today, I want to acknowledge uh, today's topic is really to discuss what was a historic milestone in the relationship between Israel and the Arab world, uh, the Negev summit, which took place uh, in the past couple of days. Uh, and we're going to unpack all of that. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that as we talk about something new for the region, we're also seeing something that painfully is not new, uh, yet another report of a terrorist uh, attack inside Israel really within the last hour where we now have uh, as many as five who are confirmed to have been killed in what is a terrorist incident. The details of the latest incident uh, are still not yet clear, but this makes 11 Israelis who have been killed in terrorist attacks in the last eight days alone. Uh, and so uh, we're obviously thinking of the victims at this time uh, and we will await further information but it obviously is a worrisome trend in the backdrop of what otherwise was a truly historic uh, week uh, with Israel hosting foreign ministers of the new normalizing countries of the UAE and Bahrain together uh, with Morocco and Egypt. Uh, and of course, also a visit uh, of King Abdullah to Ramallah followed up by a visit between the King and the Defense Minister Benny Gantz earlier today there is a tremendous amount of regional activity in the backdrop of regional concerns and, of course, this growing wave of terrorism that we're seeing uh, in uh, Israeli cities. So I'm sure we're going to unpack all of this. We're going to welcome your questions uh, over the course of the next hour because we really have a tremendous panel to join us and a tremendous moderator. I'm very pleased to pass the floor over to our, our new Director of Policy Research, Shira Efron, who will lead our conversation uh, today. With that, thanks again for joining us and I'll turn it over to you, Shira. Thank you, David, and uh, good evening from uh, Israel. Thank you all for joining us. I'm also, like David, saddened uh, to report them hearing sirens outside my window um, of this horrific terrorist, uh, which looks like another terrorist attack in Israel. But before we uh, get to the old Middle East, which I'm sure we will discuss today. Uh, let's uh, enjoy uh, the new Middle East for a little bit. Um, so as you all know, on Sunday and Monday, Israeli Foreign Minister Yari Lapid hosted the Negev Summit, first time, um, really an unprecedented historical gathering uh, with the foreign ministers, uh, as David mentioned, UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Egypt, and US Secretary of State. Uh, notably missing was uh, Jordan. Uh, whose king, as David mentioned, was in Ramallah at the same time. Uh, Lapid has since announced that the Negev Summit um, will become a permanent form for regional cooperation, left the door open for um, newcomers, uh, primarily on shared security threats. Um, to discuss what this means for the Middle East, for Israeli-Arab relations, for the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, I really can't think of a better panel. We are joined today by Nimrod Novik, uh, IPF's uh, Israel fellow and former Israeli diplomat with substantial experience working with Egypt and Jordan. Uh, Farah Badur, political anal analyst at the Amman Center for Peace and Development, and Ambassador Hisham Youssef, a senior fellow at the United States uh, US Institute of Peace and uh, a former Egyptian diplomat. Um, as always, we welcome your questions. Please type them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and a recording of this broadcast will be published later on our website. So with that, uh, Nimrod, Farah, and Hisham, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Nimrod, let's, let's start with you. Um, please provide us with some background. The Negev Summit was just announced last week, and it seemed like a big surprise because it took place just a few days uh, after it was announced. But how long has this summit been in the making? Uh, what role did Yair Lapid have um, in its convening? And was there any significant US involvement or is it primarily an Israeli endeavor with Israeli trying to assert a more um, assertive diplomatic posture in the region? 
we're delighted to join the platform with uh, Sarah and uh, Sean, uh, friends, uh, colleagues, and, and experts on, on these subjects. Um, uh, this is when everybody is focused on the broader picture. Uh, the question you just posed is, is sort of parochial, uh, but to me, very as an Israeli, is a very very important. Um, I think that uh, what we've seen again from a parochial perspective uh, is another uh, indication of the emergence of a um, potential serious leader here. Uh, since the moment that uh, Yair Lapid walked into the foreign ministry. Uh, it's a different place. Uh, that place was shuttered by uh, previous uh, foreign ministers who cared very little about the ministry. Uh, they each saw it as a stepping stone for something else. Um, and uh, mostly it was the prime minister who was running uh, the important things on foreign policy, uh, leaving the residual uh, to the diplomat. Um, the morale there was down, uh, productivity uh, accordingly, uh, but uh, with Yair Lapid, this is a new spirit. And, and, and this story of, of the Negev summit um, is, is sort of encapsulates it all. Um, realizing that, uh, that um, uh, Secretary of State uh, Blinken is, is, is coming to Israel and, and elsewhere, Ramallah and more, um, he uh, just very creatively decided to seize on the, the opportunity uh, in order to bring together uh, as many of the relevant players as, as possible. Um, his, his initial assumption was uh, that the most likely candidate would be the United Arab Emirates because there is tension between the US and the UAE. And here's an opportunity uh, to try and do, do something about it. Uh, but um, very quickly, they decided to invite uh, all the peace partners. Uh, certainly the, 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 the most important and the, the initial one is Egypt, uh, the, 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 the Jordan, which enjoys a completely different uh, uh, Israeli policy uh, since the new government uh, came on, uh, as well as the, uh, the, norm, the new normalizers. Um, they, he did not send official invitations uh, because he didn't want to face a situation where one country will decline. And therefore it was all done uh, sort of informally uh, formal informal invitations, uh, and all those who attended, of course, are the ones who, uh, who accepted, uh, with the exception of Jordan that uh, chose not to attend. How how interesting and how Israeli um, and you know uh, to do this informally to convene something like this informally within a few days, but 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 it did work. Um, Hisham, I. I want to move to you because much of the coverage of the substance of the summit has been um, on Iran. Um, and there's discussions of, there discussion about the new regional architecture against Iran. What will it look like? How does this potential re-entry of the US into the JCPOA, whatever, if it's going to be called JCPOA again, um, uh, factors into this collaboration. Um, and if you can shed some light on, you know, we know there's a convergence of interest on the general threat of Iran, but where the parties are diverging types, you know, the, 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 in their fears. Well, thank you very much, Shira. It's a pleasure to be with you, with uh, Farah and with Nimrod. Um, well, you have asked a number of questions. In relation to the first part, I agree with you, Shira. Much of the coverage uh, of the media have been focusing on addressing the Iranian threat. I'm not sure that uh, this is exactly what happened in the deliberations of, uh, in the meeting. I know how important uh, the issue of Iran is for Israel and for a number of countries in, in, the, regions, in the region, but uh, other countries have different interests and perhaps were approaching uh, the, the summit uh, with uh, different objectives and different issues on their mind as to what they want to, to discuss. And we can go into details about, about what exactly the interest of, of each country was in uh, the Q&A. Uh, but you also asked Shira about the new regional architecture uh, and, and that the perception is that this is a new regional ar architecture against Iran and what it, it looks like and so on. Well, 
let me tell you what I know from an Egyptian perspective. And of course, I'm not talking uh, in an official capacity. This is my personal capacity. Uh, I think that Egypt will not join any alliance or any architecture that is against a country or against something. And I think this is one of the, region, the reasons why Egypt withdrew uh, from the Middle East Strategic Alliance, the MESA, that was led by the United States, exactly for that reason, because Egypt felt that it was moving in this direction uh, in a, a very exclusive, exclusive way, that they will be working uh, from a security perspective against uh, Iran. Um, I think this forum uh, that was established is supposed to be a forum for cooperation rather than an alliance. I'm not sure whether it would be an architecture or not, but, uh, but mind you, it was only the foreign minister of Israel who mentioned the issue of uh, the architecture. I think it was framed differently by other participants, including Secretary Blinken. But I think uh, perhaps had a framing that I thought was quite interesting because he spoke about a more stable, integrated region that gives a, strongest, a stronger foundation for addressing shared threats and achieve shared opportunities. So I think this is much closer to probably what was discussed. Uh, you also asked another question about the re-entry of the US in the nuclear deal and uh, whether this issue was raised and how and, and, and so on. I'm sure this issue was raised uh, because this is one of the issues that is on the mind of everybody, especially with the news that perhaps uh, uh, an agreement is imminent. Uh, so, you know, but I think many, all those who were in this meeting recognize a number of issues. First, that this issue is important and is a priority for the Biden administration. Second, they know that the administration believes that the maximum pressure policy adopted by the previous administration did not work. And they also have a plan to follow these negotiations by additional negotiations in relation to commitments pertaining to nuclear activities of Iran and also nuclear policies uh, of Iran in the region. I think what is important for the countries of the region to start discussing how they will pursue that. Of course, Israel and Iran will not talk to each other, uh, but then many other countries in the region can do so. So just like for the nuclear deal, we had the P5 plus one, I think also for the next phase of negotiations, we need a platform to address the remaining concerns. Thank you, Isham. Maybe just a quick follow up on this before we get to Farah. You know, there are two issues. First of all, there's the nuclear dimension, which you which you mentioned. Um, and there are analysts who say that this is going to bring a nuclear arms race in the region. This is one set of concern. But um, it seems that several of these countries, Egypt included, the UAE, certainly Saudis, the nuclear uh, issue is not at the top of their concerns when we talk about Iran, it's more the missiles and the, re you know, the regional activities, which are not part of the JCPOA and will not become part of this negotiation anytime in the future. So if you just make a quick comment about that. Well, yes and no. Uh, of course, of course, the nuclear uh, uh, nuclear weapons are not the foremost concern for some of the countries, uh, but for a country like Egypt, it is. Uh, not necessarily as an immediate uh, issue to be addressed now, but it will be addressed at one point in time, and this is important for Egypt. Uh, for Saudi Arabia, it is more concerned about the nuclear activities of Iran, but perhaps not, not the other countries. But I think this issue will increase in importance and it is very interesting because it will be linked in some ways to what happened in Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine had to forego the nuclear weapons that they had on their land, but then that's a totally different story in relation to how nuclear proliferation will be affected by what is happening in Ukraine and developments in the region. Right, and what types of incentives you need to offer for countries to uh, give up on nuclear weapons in the future. Um, okay. 
Farah, I think of all, of all the Arab countries which Israel has full diplomatic relations and one that really improved ties with, right? We know the Defense Minister Benny Gantz was just there now. Um, Nimrod said a whole new, a whole different policy of the Israeli government toward Jordan. But still, Jordan didn't send a representative to the summit. And at the same time, uh, King Abdullah visited Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah yesterday. What is the significance of Jordan's absence uh, from the Negev summit? How is it tied to the Palestinian issue? Um, and if you know, how did the Israeli-Palestinian conflict feature in the discussions, um, not just in the public statements, but uh, more in the depth talks? Thank you for having me, Shira. Um, I would say before answering this question, um, I want to take you back uh, to the time when King Abdullah was the first Arab leader to meet President Biden in Washington, D.C. last July. And during his visit, uh, the king stated that it is the time for regional partners to do the heavy lifting for the U.S. and address regional problems as the U.S. pulls back and focuses on Russia and China. So the notion of a proactive engagement is strongly encouraged by Jordan. In fact, in in Article 4 of our peace treaty with Israel, we have committed to the creation of a conference on security and cooperation in the Middle East along the lines of Helsinki process, and we are committed to the creation of a region free from the weapons of mass destruction and all its forms, and we have refrained from hostile alliances and coalitions. So again, this is to say that the notion of forming a framework for cooperation that brings security to all its partners, including Israel, is strongly encouraged by our our country. However, from a Jordanian perspective, regional security and stability can't be achieved without reaching just and comprehensive peace uh, on the basis of a two-state solution, which guarantees the establishment of an independent Palestinian state on the 67 lines with Jerusalem as its, its capital. So that's Jordan number one priority. That's Jordan number one national interest. When it comes to the Naqab summit, the priorities are different among participants. For Israel, it is to build a coalition against Iran. Most of Hebrew news describe the summit as, as such. Uh, the UAE shares the Israeli priority to face uh, Iranian proxies in the region, but also is interested in clean energy. Uh, Bahrain is prioritizing uh, the maritime uh, security, uh, while Morocco and Egypt, they are more concerned about uh, food and energy security. And this is, of course, not to say that the Palestinian issue was not, um, that, that it was completely absent uh, in the summit. Uh, both Shukri and Blinken raised the Palestinian issue and called parties to refrain from taking any measures that jeopardize the viability of two-state solution. However, we're still talking about um, you know, shrinking the conflict. On the other hand, uh, the minister referral to the Palestinian uh, issue did not really address the negative sensitivity the summit has among the Jordanian and the Palestinian public who view the summit through the lens of uh, Trump's peace for prosperity. So, and I have to say that in post-pandemic and post-Ukrainian uh, uh, issue, public opinion is a game uh, changer. So to answer your question, um, Jordan's refraining from participating at the summit meant to send the message that any regional framework needs to prioritize the Palestinian issue as a major cause for instability in the region. Uh, we know that for years we have seen how the Palestinian uh, suffering has been rallying a cry for ISIS uh, who, who justify its action as a way to defend the Palestinian rights. And we already have an example from last year round of violence in Jerusalem and Gaza, and we are more likely to witness uh, another round of violence uh, on a larger uh, scale this year. Hopefully, with a uh, Ramallah meeting between King Abdullah and uh, uh, the Palestinian President Abbas, um, along with today's um, meeting between King Abdullah and the, the Defense Minister Gantz, and tomorrow with uh, President Herzog, hopefully that these meetings will add the missing layer for the Naqab summit. Hopefully, it will address uh, the, the credibility gap uh, with the public. Hopefully it will block spoilers. Hopefully it will avoid a very likely escalation that might have set the whole region on fire. Yeah, this is a 
right? It's a playbook that we know already. And I too, like like you, you know, we have uh, Ramadan and Passover and Easter all happening at the same time. Uh, it could be positive uh, processes also with Turkey, who's a player in East Jerusalem to calm things down also. But I mean, what we're seeing the last week is obviously uh, it doesn't bode very well for the region. I just want to tell you, it's really interesting because you mentioned the Palestinians, you're talking about bridging the gap. And Isham, this goes to you, you know, of course, the Palestinian topic was mentioned by participants. Uh, Egypt, of course, was most detailed, right? It says 67 board I'm just reading, sorry, for, in a Palestinian uh, uh, capital in Jerusalem. Uh, but to me, what was really telling is what Secretary Blinken said, which felt um, that this was really deprioritized. He says, and I'm quoting, one of the issues we discussed today was how countries involved in the Abraham Accords and normalization, as well as those that have longstanding diplomatic relations with Israel, can support the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian people in concrete ways and have a positive impact on the daily lives of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. I'm not hearing self-determination. I'm not hearing two states. It seems that the US also subscribed to, this is what we can do today, uh, con, you know, CBMs, uh, improving the lives, shrinking the conflict, if you will. And this is something that I think uh, for organizations like Israel Policy Forum, for Jordan, obviously for Egypt, for all of us concerned, this is, uh, it, 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 they aim lower um, than others. And, and we can get to it. I don't know if others want to um, to comment on that also. And I also want to remind uh, the audience to ask questions. There were a lot of questions on why Jordan didn't uh, uh, join and Farah already addressed it. So please send us more questions on that. Um, Nimrod, if you want to say, I, I want to ask you something about, um, you know, sort of the regional dynamics. Um, you know, the negative, sum the negative summit is indicative of uh, really a high, all-time high, I guess, in Israeli-Arab relations. Uh, but it also comes at a very low point in U.S. Um, relations with some of its regional partners. Uh, we are ha hearing reports that uh, Saudi and Emirati crown princesses were dodging President Biden's phone calls. Um, uh, Blinken visited, uh, uh, canceled his visit to the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's some games around, you know, uh, producing more oil, which is really needed at the time. So. What are the implications of these tensions in U.S. Arab ties on Israeli Arab relations? And of course, if you want to make a comment on the Palestinian uh, topic as well. Yeah, I'd like to make a couple of points that are based off on something that Clara said, as well as your question. Um, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, which we have not thus far. Um, and the, the only comment that I would add was is that. Uh, certain Saudi officials took the trouble uh, of sharing with Israeli journalists uh, their favorite view of, the, of this gathering, uh, which is telling in and of itself. Um, you know, th th there were two reactions, basically, if, if you cluster the reactions to the, the coverage and the reactions, you can cluster them in two. The cynics that say that this was a photo opportunity no more, uh, and those who exaggerate who say this was a historical break. Uh, historical breakthroughs don't happen every day. Not every day we have Sadat uh, coming to Jerusalem. Uh, this happens uh, once in a lifetime. Um, what we saw here, as, as Hisham mentioned, was different leaders who are coming with varying agendas, getting together, bringing all the agenda on the table, and trying to find common denominators. This goes step by step, this goes slowly, this is not a historical breakthrough. Um, um, there was everything on the table there. There was Ukraine because of the implications of food and energy. Uh, there was Iran because of the reasons that have been discussed. There was the Palestinian issue, um, and here I want to accentuate a point. Um, there is a conventional wisdom that the Abraham Accords are immune to development in the Israeli-Palestinian arena. Um, it is not just the Egyptian and Jordanian precedent that show differently. It's also the perception of the new normalizers that is telling differently. I, I would just mention that uh, during uh, last May, the 11 days fighting, um, uh, our Minister of Defense, uh, Benny Gantz, received six, six phone calls from new normalizers urging him to
to contain the violence and get it uh, get it over with as soon as possible, uh, because hostiles at home and abroad are using it to delegitimize the normalizers regimes, uh, and as quote we might not be able to proceed as fast as we wish with normalization uh, if this goes on for a long time. Where is it relevant? And, and the same, the same heard, uh, Minister Bennett heard the same thing when he visited Bahrain just a few weeks ago. Same message. Uh, that one was already in advance of April when the three uh, holidays of the three monotheistic religions converge. Um, they were all, and that came up in uh, the Negev as well. The concern with instability that will ignite violence. Uh, that was certainly the message that uh, His Majesty King uh, Abdullah conveyed to, uh, to uh, uh, Benny Gantz when he saw him earlier this week, and that uh, our Minister of uh, Homeland Security, Barlev, heard in Amman last week. Uh, and I suspect that when the court issues the statement after the meeting with President Herzog tomorrow, we're gonna to see the same. Calm down, no provocation, not in Jerusalem, not elsewhere. Contain uh, uh, settler, extreme settler violence. So the linkage between the Palestinian issue and normalization that many thought did not exist and it was bypassed uh, uh, is certainly there. Um, the, the, the conference was conducted along uh, two uh, loose concepts. One was bilaterals, a series of bilaterals, and the other was multilateral. And we know for sure that in the bilaterals, uh, issues of regional security and the architecture that, uh, that Tisham mentioned uh, came up. Uh, not that anybody walks away with an architecture in his uh, jacket uh, pocket, uh, but nano steps in the direction of coordination, of taking uh, what already existed for years of uh, intelligence sharing and other security uh, coordinations, taking it out of the basement uh, into a more visible and more uh, comprehensive uh, setting. Uh, uh, all that was launched uh, in, the, in, the, in the Negev summit, uh, but for it to proceed, the Palestinian issue cannot be ignored. Well, I guess someone in Israel would, would, would disagree in the Israeli government, but but yeah, uh, absolutely. I don't think so. I don't think so. No? I don't think so. I think when you see the measures that the new government is taking, uh, it is slow. Uh, it's a complicated coalition. And Yair Lapid will be the first one to tell you that he has to walk very carefully in order not to shatter the coalition, but the direction is clear. Uh, they are using all kinds of empty, or seemingly empty slogans, like shrinking the conflict and strengthening the PA, um, or even the American uh, new slogan of Israelis and Palestinians deserve equal measure, prosperity, uh, tranquility, uh, security, and many other things. And as you noted, something is missing there, self-determination. Um, but they are, they are beginning to more uh, flesh on the bones of what, well, of what started out as empty, empty slogan. I think everybody understands that you need tranquility and you don't have tranquility uh, without constructive policy that has two layers to it. One, you stop provocations and two, you do the good stuff. Right. No, no, the, no disagreement on this, but, you know, there's the, the short term and what do you do and provide a lifeline to the PA, but is it uh, state building, and this is where uh, there's a there's a gap. But but I want to go back to another bilateral uh, relations. Hisham, this summit really comes at a historic time, I think, in Egypt-Israel relations. Just last week, uh, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi hosted Prime Minister Naftali Bennett uh, for a summit in Sharm el-Sheikh for the second time, um, which was also the first time that an Israeli uh, premier slept on Egyptian soil in 20 years. Uh, pretty remarkable. What does President Sisi gain in forming deeper ties with Israel? Um, and how have these diplomatic endeavors been uh, covered in Egyptian media and uh, taken by the Egyptian public? 
Thank you, Shiva. Let me, let me start by differing somewhat from what Nimrod uh, said. Uh, he said that the direction is clear. And I think uh, that is part of the problem. The direction is not that clear. Uh, we need to have more clarity. And uh, not only as Egyptians and Jordanians, but I think it's for the Palestinians. And this is why we have been hammering on the importance of the political horizon. Uh, because, because I think without the political horizon, many of the things that may be useful can become uh, much more difficult. But in relation to your question, uh, Shiva, you know that the Egyptian-Israeli relations uh, have had their ups and downs. Uh, but at the end of the day, they are extremely solid relations. And you also know that the role of Egypt was instrumental in ending the war on Gaza last May. And before that, in the exchange of prisoners, and before that, uh, in all kinds of issues, and Israel and Egypt cooperation on security issues, uh, where Israel allowed Egypt to increase its military presence in Sinai and so on. So the relation is uh, a solid relation. Uh, and I think that advancing these relations is important, both to Egypt and to Israel and to the security and stability of the region as a whole. Um, but as to how this was covered in the Egyptian media, um, you know, I, as you have seen in the press conference, there were several mentions of uh, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel uh, 43 years ago. Uh, so. Uh, many of these issues are no longer uh, grabbing the major headlines as they used to, uh, especially that Egypt is now facing all kinds of difficulties as a result of the Ukraine war and food security, uh, and uh, the Egyptian pound is having some difficulties and so on. So perhaps uh, these issues grab the headlines in countries that have newly normalized relations, uh, but not necessarily uh, in the Egyptian media, but I think it is it was seen as an effort to try to see how to uh, set the stage in a direction that would allow uh, things to improve on the, at the Palestinian uh, uh, level. But I want to I want to add one point, not in relation to uh, the Egyptian media. I want to add something in relation to public opinion in Israel and the media in Israel, because I I hope that the media in Israel would also focus on a number of issues. One of them is that there is a feeling in Israel that the Arab world has forgotten the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I hope that one of the messages that came out of this meeting is that the vast majority of those who are, were in, at the podium, the six leaders that were on, on the podium, the vast majority of them mentioned the two-state solution and the need to move and advance on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict. And the second is in relation to the fact that there is also uh, a sentiment in Israel that uh, the Arab countries do not want us in the region. And I think if there is a message that is coming out of this summit as well is that no, uh, the Arab world is accepting Israel in the region and is willing, willing to work with Israel and cooperate with Israel, but that there is a ceiling. And this ceiling is related to advancement on the Palestinian question. Right, but uh, I think uh, summits like this and improved ties uh, also send a signal that the ceiling is much lower than, uh, right? Uh, I'm sorry, ce ceiling is much higher, that there's really no ceiling because you know, again, advanced ties. It's also interesting uh, what you said, it's true that Israeli uh, Egyptian ties have been solid, but I guess what, what we're seeing now that is a little bit different is there used to be G to G, government to government, military to military, but we are seeing at least an attempt to expand them in other dimensions as well, which is very positive for both countries. Both countries need that. Um, you know, the ceiling may be high in, in one case as opposed to another. Uh, so the ceiling for the image may be a little higher for Bahrain, maybe a little slower, uh, lower uh, for Jordan, as we heard from Farah, that they have some difficulties and so on. So the, the ceiling may differ, but then there is a ceiling. And that's the important thing. If we want to remove the ceiling, then we have to have some progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front in order for this ceiling to, work, ceiling to be removed and for the potential that uh, Secretary Blinken was talking about 
to be achieved or for us to be closer to that uh, uh, objective. Isham, can I just a quick, quick follow up since, um, you know, you talk about the Palestinian issue clearly, I mean, you know, Israel and Egypt both border the Gaza Strip. You indicated that Egypt was instrumental in, in the ceasefire that was achieved in May. In fact, Egypt has been instrumental to every ceasefire uh, in the past, you know, decade. Um, and at this time, it took a more uh, public role in this. Can you give us an update on just very quickly on uh, Egypt's uh, reconstruction efforts in, in Gaza, uh, really, again, an active role in, in, in Gaza that we haven't seen uh, in recent years. Reconstruction is a very complicated process, particularly when it comes to the situation in Gaza and restrictions, because it requires coordination, very close coordination with Israel, because Israel is fearing uh, that some of the equipment or some of the uh, resources can be, you know, go to other activities and so on. So this has been uh, an issue that is subject to discussions between Egypt and Israel. But my understanding is that most of the rubble as a result of the destruction has been removed and that, you know, some form of uh, construction have already started, but I think it's in very early stages. And it, it will take time, I think, for things advance to a much more meaningful uh, level uh, for uh, addressing the Palestinian needs after the war that took place in May. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Farah, going back to the Palestinians, you know, they've been obviously vocally critical of the Negev summit, uh, consistent with their previous opposition to Arab Israeli normalization. And do you have ideas what what could be done to encourage Palestinian involvement in these normalization efforts going forward? Um, how interested are the Arab states in bringing the Palestinians into those discussions? Clearly, they're not all equally interested. So, if you can sort of give us the you know uh, the different uh, the, the the variation in that, um, and is there any prospects for it actually happening? Well, uh, moving from ceiling to building blocks, I think uh, the name uh, of the game uh, will be in, in the future, uh, will be the confidence building measures. Uh, under BB and after uh, years and years of systematic damaging uh, to the relationship, not only with the Palestinians, but with the Jordanians as well, I think uh, there is a crucial need to invest heavily in healing this damaged relationship and bridging the mistrust. And what we are seeing right now uh, from the Israeli officials holding meetings with Jordanian counterparts is part of that healing mission. Uh, the first real test would, of course, be Ramadan um, next month, actually next week, uh, and the um, Jewish holidays. So we are talking about, uh, and, I, and I'm, I know I'm shifting uh, the, the, the burden on Israel, but we are talking about um, Israel refraining from taking um, any unilateral actions that to provoke yet another round of violence, uh, respecting uh, the legal and historic uh, status of Jerusalem, in addition to um, introduction of measures that has a direct uh, impact on the Palestinian lives, like increasing the work permits, freedom of worship for Palestinians in Jerusalem. However, of course, we can't uh, fool ourselves and think that uh, this is enough. Uh, I think uh, we should start normalize the discussion that um, taking measures um, um, and, and should address reversing facts on the ground uh, when it comes to settlers, uh, to the Israeli presence um, in the occupied uh, territories. And of course, that should coincide with uh, reciprocal me measures from um, the Palestinian side. Uh, when it comes to whether Arabs are interested in bringing uh, Palestinians to the forum or not, I think the framing of the question is uh, somehow not really right. Uh, it should not be whether uh, they want to include them or not. It should be how 
to include the Palestinian. And as I said uh, earlier, the, the, the public opinion will be a game changer uh, in the region in post pandemic and Ukrainian crisis. All regional countries uh, will be vulnerable to inflation, um, to food and energy um, fluctuations as, as well. And our public, uh, of course, sympathize with the Palestinians. Um, and I already touched upon how um, the extreme groups will use the Palestinian uh, cause as a rallying cry. So it's a matter of common sense that the Arab countries uh, will take measures uh, for their own national interest and legitimacy um, and show their commitment to the Palestinian cause. Um, and here, I think Jordan uh, could play a vital role in coordinating these um, efforts. And this is not to say that I'm putting all the blame on, on, on Israel, but I'm saying that there are a lot of room for investigating um, a new confidence building measure that is reciprocal on both sides. You know, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to, you know, we are hearing um, about these terror attacks, one in Hadera, which actually happened during the summit. Do you think there is a link? I'll start with you, uh, Far this time. You know, um, there's a link between the summit and those recent terror attacks. Um, and the reports are now that uh, the person who um, committed the terror attack today was actually uh, the Laksa Brigades uh, from, from Janine. But uh, to be brief, one had uh, ties to ISIS. And you know, I know regional countries are concerned about the rising of ISIS in the region. Can you connect the dots on, on these things? Of course, uh, as I said, like the spoilers uh, will wait no, no opportunity uh, to uh, implement their agenda and use the Palestinian cause as, as a rallying cry for, uh, for that. And let me take you back to the uh, summer of, uh, of last year. Uh, the extremist group, Hamas and others, they completely regained the narrative uh, among a population that is very young. Um, most of uh, the, the Palestinians and Jordanians, they suppose um, they support extremism, and in one way or another, they justify the use of, of, of violence. So again, uh, I think it's very important, and that's why uh, Jordan uh, did not really participate in, in the Naqab summit, it's just to send the message that we are standing in solidarity with the Palestinian people, and uh, we will uh, work on um, just to prepping, the prepping the ground and maintain the viability of two-state solution. But you are, you know, sitting in Amman, you are... Um aware of the, the growing fears of, of a resurrection of ISIS uh, in the region? This is an issue that we are uh, seeing on a, on a, on a daily uh, basis, whether in our uh, the attacks on, on, on the border, in the eastern uh, border or the northern border. And there is always uh, some extreme group, group that will uh, use what's happening in west of the river uh, to justify and, uh, you know, penetrate and uh, try to uh, design operations, whether in Jordan or, or other uh, Jordanians or guys. Thank you. Um, Nimrod, I... There's a question here from uh, Calvin Blinder on uh, other spoilers, the Israeli spoilers. There's, the question is, what are the Israeli, what, I guess, what is the Israeli re reaction to the need to deal with the Palestinian issue, which you mentioned some of the, you know, the steps that Israel is taking, but a specific question on will the government work to reduce settler uh, provocations, violence? Um, can you touch on that? Yes. Um, I think here. Uh, I can't uh, hear you, Nimrod. I don't know if it's just me. Can you hear me now? Is it yes. Here? Okay. Um, we, I think we are witnessing two, two conflicting and related uh, trends. Um, one trend is that it took the government long, too long, uh, to appreciate the severity of the issue and the potential damaging consequences of extreme settler violence. Um, and I'm saying extreme settler violence, I would say the extremists are those who exercise, not, but they enjoy broad support in the settler community and leadership. Uh, not comprehensive, but broad. Um, so we saw, we witnessed intensifying settler violence, just as the government, primarily obviously the Ministry of Defense and the IDF and Shin Bet, uh, where, um, um, where, where, where the message that this has to be stopped 
begin to penetrate from the top gradually uh, to the uh, troops on the ground. And we have seen uh, uh, steps that uh, had not been taken uh, previously uh, in terms of uh, IDF engagement in uh, arresting, in detaining, in uh, uh, forwarding to the police, in, in, in protecting the police as it enters. Uh, we have seen steps that we have not seen before. Concurrently, we've seen the settlers intensifying the effort, uh, apparently uh, trying to test the envelope and uh, present the government with, uh, with a reality that it cannot contain. Um, there are people in the government who are not uh, full-heartedly behind this effort. Um, um, but I think that it sunk in, I, I will illustrate it with two statements of the prime minister. Statement number one, um, these are fine young Israeli men. And statement number two is that uh, those criminals have to be brought to justice. And there are quite a few weeks between the two. Uh, and that was the, the, the period when the defense establishment was conveying upward the concern that those outlaws, those uh, vigilantes are going to ignite uh, the West Bank. Thank you, um, Nimrod. Hisham, I want to take you sort of through the broader, you know, outside of the Middle East, big things are happening in the world. What was uh, the level of discussion on Ukraine in the summit? Um, what's common, what's different between the different countries' position on Ukraine, Russia? Uh, I think none of them is actually perfectly aligned with the US. Uh, so that's interesting. And you, you know, you spoke about it a little bit earlier about the, the implications of, uh, of, the, of the war there on, on, on sort of on the region. So if you can expand a little bit about that uh, in the context of the summit. Well, I don't know the level of details in which this issue was discussed between, uh, you know, in the summit itself, but probably it was also subject to the bilaterals that Nimrod was talking about. Uh, Egypt is uh, the number one importer of wheat in the whole world. Uh, and the prices of wheat has increased tremendously. And also the price of oil has increased. So this will have a huge impact on Egypt. It will have also an impact on uh, Morocco, uh, but but the devastating impact will be on Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. Uh, so the region as a whole will suffer. Uh, but I think you were talking about the, the bigger picture. And I think the bigger picture is also related to the fact that the perception in the region that the U.S. is leading. And as a result of the fact that, uh, you know, the region is preparing for the U.S. withdrawal in some way or another, uh, then there is also a vacant that will be created for others to enter. And as we know, and as a result of the war in Ukraine as well, uh, the Middle East is one of the regions that will be a focus for both Russia and China uh, in different ways. Uh, Russia will be focused mainly on the security and political side, and China will be focused more on the investment and trade side. And uh, this has started already. Uh, so we have seen the expansion of the role of Russia after Syria. It, is, uh, it has become closer in Libya, it, working on Mali and so on. And China has been working with the Belt and Road Initiative in the vast majority of the countries in the region. And it is welcome uh, in different ways. And this is also causing a problem to the US. So from a strategic point of view, I think, I think the United States will have to come up with uh, a much more uh, acceptable arrangement in relation to the role that it is expected to play in the region uh, for the benefit of all, for the benefit of the US and the benefit of the countries uh, uh, in the region. And the Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot escape this whole equation. And we know, we recognize all the difficulties facing Israel regarding, regarding the coalition and so on. And we recognize also the, the, the difficulties on the Palestinian side with also the division between the West Bank and Gaza and so on. 
But this does not prevent us from saying we need to agree on a political horizon, on a final destination, and we know that it will take a long time, but we have to keep a marker for that. Otherwise, we will be sliding to all kinds of difficulties from a strategic perspective. Thank you for that. And thank you also for mentioning the dependence of Egypt and this region on food imports. Egypt in particular, I think the numbers that I know is that uh, it's 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 uh, it imports 70% of its wheat from Russia and Ukraine. So it's not just dependence on you know wheat imports in general, uh, actually from these specific countries. And we've seen this dependence, what it led to in 2010. Uh, then it was back uh, uh, in following a severe drought. Um, there is a question here in the chat of, what was food dis security discussed in the meeting, but I want to take it broader. I, you know, the reports are that six teams, six working teams have emerged uh, from the meeting, but uh, I haven't seen anything on sort of climate change, food security, even though this is top of the agenda of Egypt now. Have you heard any of um, sort of follow-up work on, on these dimensions that are so real to people's lives and human security before we speak about national security and regional one? Well, climate change will be one of the top agenda items for the region in the coming two years. We have in November uh, COP27 in Egypt and COP28 in the following year in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, so the region, this is an indication that the region recognizes that uh, climate change will be a crucial issue and will have to be addressed in uh, a more concerted way and a more effective way. So this is one. And, and as far as uh, food security is concerned, I think uh, even between the, in the bilateral relations between Israel and Egypt, it has, it has relied on cooperation in the area of agriculture uh, for decades, uh, including uh, aspects pertaining to technology, irrigation, and so on. So the use of water and agricultural uh, expertise uh, was one of the areas of cooperation uh, between Israel and Egypt. And I think this will continue, not only between Israel and Egypt, I think this would be one of the future cooperation in addressing uh, food security uh, and addressing issues pertaining to water shortages, particularly in light of the difficulties Egypt is facing today regarding the Renaissance Bell. Thank you. Farah, I want to um, go back to you. There are a few questions in the chat of, you know, what can Arab countries, and I think particularly we talk about Egypt and Jordan, but let's talk about Jordan do to sort of, don't want to frame this a bit, like help the Palestinians help themselves. There's a lot of uh, talk about Palestinian succession. There's a lot of talk about uh, uh, even possible collapse of the PA being its weakest uh, uh, time now, not just fiscally, but also in terms of governance. What, uh, how can, um, Jordan, and maybe you can comment on other countries, help um, help the PA with reforms, how concerned Jordan is about the stability of the PA, um, and is there a way that the, the Arab countries can also help uh, bridge the divide between uh, the, you know, Fatah and Hamas, which is a precondition to a Palestinian state, or maybe it's not a precondition, but it would be one of the, one of the, what, definitely one of the biggest challenges to it. Uh, yes, sure. I read this uh, analysis that uh, starts to talk about a Jordanian role in the West Bank, uh, but I will be very hesitant uh, in uh, supporting this uh, analysis and assume that if uh, the PA uh, collapse, if uh, um, President Abbas, uh, you know, due to his uh, uh, age, uh, um, he will, God forbid, you know, pass away. Uh, and the fact that there is no uh, agreement on who is the successor of, uh, um, of, uh, of the president. I, I, I would be very hesitant to say that Jordan will uh, jump in uh, to step in this uh, vacuum. So uh, I, I, will, I will say that Jordan will keep on uh, the commitment uh, to the state building. We work with the European partners in order to uh, link any aid, uh, um, you know, provided for the, for the PA uh, and link it to uh, governance uh, measures uh, that it's really um, um, vivid and in the ground. Um, and I also, uh, the Jordan has been always uh, calling for uh, the need to establish a regional security, um, you know, architecture, uh, knowing that uh, the region, the Middle East is
is the only region in the world that has no uh, formal uh, architecture. Uh, all our alliances are uh, at best are liquid. Uh, so there is no um, a question that any attempt uh, to form the nucleus for uh, security architecture is welcome in Jordan, be it food uh, uh, security, energy. Uh, and within this umbrella, uh, Jordan hopes to uh, address uh, the Palestinian um, issue. But I think the main lesson that uh, should be taken here um, that taking the opportunity of uh, regional and global uh, momentum means so uh, that we should learn from previous lessons and reassess the situation uh, in the new uh, context and once and for all have the political will, you know, um, and, and the courage uh, to take decision and address uh, the root causes of, of the conflict. But another, another way to reiterate uh, the answer, uh, I will be very hesitant uh, to expect um, a Jordanian role uh, in the West Bank. Uh, I think uh, Jordan really support multilateralism and the establishment of uh, a regional security architecture that can address the root causes of uh, conflicts in, in the region. However, prioritize the Palestinian issue. Thank you. For, I didn't mean to insinuate, of course, that Jordan will sort of take an active role in the West Bank, but it is, you know, a mutual interest that, you know, Palestinian uh, stability, stability of the PA uh, in the West Bank. And as we know, uh, these reforms, uh, we've all been talking about them, but they're not easy. Um, I just want to, you know, I, maybe just, it was announced that the Negev Summit is going to become a permanent forum possibly convening even twice a year. What's your bet? Do you think Jordan would, would join next time? I think after Ramadan, uh, we will have like a better picture, uh, especially uh, from the Israeli commitment uh, toward uh, stabilizing uh, the West Bank. So uh, as I said, I think Jordan is committed to be part of any regional security that brings stability in the region. But again, there's a lot of work that should be put on the ground and a lot of, uh, you know, putting your, your, your money where, where your mouth is, as they say. So with that, I have one last question from uh, Bob Sugarman, uh, IPF board member, and I'll take it to, uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Hisham and then Nimrod, and um, unfortunately, then our time is up. Uh, so Bob is asking, there are those who say that the active participation of Secretary Blinken in the current event signals that the U.S. is not withdrawing from the region. What is your view? I just want to add to this, because you mentioned multilateralism and international aid. Um, at the same time, it was reported yesterday that the president's budget, and there's going to be a lot of push from Congress, but the president's budget to the Palestinians is lower um, in the numbers than Congress asked for. For Palestinian security forces, it used to be 75 million, now it's 33 million. Humanitarian is instead of 225 million, 185 million. So, so what are we talking? It's like the talk, the talk, walk, the walk, Hisham. Well, perception is more important than reality. And the perception and the vision is that the United States is leaving. The United States needs, needs to do much, much more in order to persuade uh, those who are following the situation quite closely that this is not the case and that the United States is there to stay. And I think uh, a lot of work needs to be done to assure all kinds of partners to the United States that uh, the United States will be there uh, when needed in relation to the needs of the region for security, stability, and prosperity. And do you think Blinken's uh, presence at the summit did that, was able to achieve that? Uh, well, you can't take it as uh, piecemeal and one step at a time. No, it has to be an overall approach that sends this message consistently uh, to the region in relation to uh, what the US strategy is, how it will uh, you know, perform the policy and adopt it and then et cetera. And I think it's a long way to go in order for this objective to be achieved. Thank you. And Nimrod, you have the final word. Look, uh, I, I would link it, uh, link these questions of yours with the previous one when you asked for the uh, uh, other Arab countries to uh, uh, do something on the Palestinian issue. Uh, and the two are related. Um, I think you and uh, Michael Kaplow noted in, a, in an IPF study called uh, The New Normal, uh, you noted something that we keep hearing from Emirati, uh, very senior Emirati officials. And that is, um, they're not gonna volunteer to get involved with the Indo-Palestinian issue, uh, except for, of course, calling upon Israel 
uh, to calm things down, calling upon the Palestinians maybe at times to calm things down, but mostly on Israel. Um, but um, their one, number one condition for getting involved is that they see a US plan and that the US mobilizes them to do so. Nobody, nobody will move seriously without American leadership. So if we want to end with some good news, the fact that Ambassador Barbara Leaf passed the committee uh, earlier today, and maybe soon we're going to have an empowered, not that Gail Lampert is not a potent leader, uh, but in a, such a small team, the addition of another expert, another very capable, knowledgeable diplomat uh, in a leadership position that is not interim, uh, maybe we're going to have a potent American working level empowered team uh, that will uh, be able to, to do the job when the president and the secretary are busy elsewhere. So uh, let's raise a, a glass for the, uh, for the confirmation of uh, Barbara Leaf. Hallelujah. Some good news on this sad evening here. Um, Nimrod Farah and uh, Hisham, uh, we ran out of time, but really thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and insights. Um, I'll pass along to David Halper to close. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank, thank you. I, I just want to add uh, my thanks to our, to our panelists, uh, Farah Hisham and, and Nimrod, and thank you to Shura for moderating. We're going to continue this uh, important conversation about the changing dynamics in the region and the impact on the Israeli-Palestinian arena. Uh, in the days, uh, weeks, and, and months to come. Uh, I hope you are all uh, already subscribed to receive our content from Michael Coplow each Thursday, uh, where we, he will further uh, provide a, a piece analyzing these issues. Uh, I hope you're also listening to the podcast, Israel Policy Pod. Our next episode will uh, absolutely unpack this growing wave uh, of violence that we're seeing in Israel. And of course, we'll welcome you back soon uh, uh, to a future webinar where we'll continue these important conversations. Again, thanks to our speakers. Uh, you can all find that study that Nimrod mentioned, the new normal at our website, israelpolicyforum.org. Uh, and of course, we encourage you to consider uh, making a contribution at that same website. Until next time, thank you all once again. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, and we look forward to the next time. Have a good afternoon, evening. <laughs>